Hi, this is Professor Dorr, and this is lecture number 14 of EE310. The subject of today's lecture is ideal transformers. We're going to begin the lecture by talking about what makes a transformer ideal, why it's different than the mutually coupled inductors that we uh, showed in the last lecture. From there, we're going to move to voltage, current, and impedance relationships for ideal transformers. And you're going to see that all those relationships can be easily um, derived based on the fact that the power, that the transformer dissipates no power. After we do that, we'll do a quick sanity check where we'll basically make sure that everything adds up around a transformer circuit. So we'll use our equations, but we'll make sure that they tell us things that are sane. After that, we'll do an ideal transformer problem, and I'm going to do the same problem. It's a problem right out of our textbook, but I'm going to do it using the equations we derive, but I'll do it three different ways. Um, I'll roll the primary up to the secondary, and then I'll roll the secondary to the primary, then I'll do a Thevenin equivalent, and by the time you've seen the problem done three different ways, you'll really know, you'll really understand this stuff, I hope. Next thing we'll do in the lecture is an example of electric power distribution, i.e., how do we get power from a power plant all the way down into your home? And you're going to see that transformers are just an integral and necessary part of our power grid. And one thing I like about this example um, is that I show some cool pictures of all the gizmos of the, the transmission towers and the substations and stuff like that. And I had a student at the end of last semester who was out um, four-wheeling in San Bernardino County with a bunch of his buddies and they got up to the top of a big hill and there was a they, they were under some big distribution wires and he and his buddies all stopped and had a beer and he explained to them how the whole system worked out there in the middle of nowhere. Of course as a professor I think that's pretty cool but I hope you like the example too. And then we're going to do an impedance matching problem for an audio system. And you remember that when I gave you the sales pitch on transformers, we talked about the transformer being used as an impedance matching device for maximum power transfer. And so we'll do an example that shows how to do that. And I'll even show you a picture of my old 1938 Philco radio, which is actually where this example came from. So let's get started. So here's a picture of an ideal transformer. And you can see there's a core here. Um, in this picture, it's kind of a rectangular cross-sectional core, but it doesn't really <clears throat> matter. It could be a round core too. I just don't draw very well. Um, but the core has some cross-sectional area. And it's a very high permeability core. So Let's look at this core. All the flux of these from these two windings are caused by these two windings. All the flux stays in the core. That's one of the conditions we need for an ideal transformer. With mutually coupled um, um, coils, all the flux doesn't stay in the core. And that's why you have your coefficient of coupling K that goes between 0 and 1. But for the ideal transform, the permeability is so high in the core that the flux just loves it there. Doesn't go anywhere else. So another um, aspect of the ideal transformer is there are lots of turns on the primary and the secondary, meaning that the inductance of the primary and secondary are very, very high. Um, and then the next thing is, and we've already alluded to this, is the coefficient of coupling is equal to 1.0 for our ideal transformer. And generally, when you buy a transformer, you go to DigiKey or whatever and buy one, you want an ideal transformer. And 
you want that transformer to be as close to ideal anyway as you can get. It turns out that transformers actually have a little bit of loss in their core and they have some IR loss in the windings, but this is EE310. And our transformers in EE310 are perfect. So let's start off with our basic transformer phasor equations. We have V1, or in other words, the voltage over here is J omega L1 I1. I1 would be coming here, plus J omega M I2. Here's the I2 over here. And V2 is a similar equation. And I wrote here that these are the transformer phasor equations, but these are the equations that cover any mutual, mutually coupled coils. So this is where we're going to start for our ideal transformer, and then we're going to use the stuff we talked about up here to make it ideal and see what it does to the math. So what I'm going to do, and I'm skipping a few steps here, but I'm going to solve equation 1 for I1. So I'm going to get I1 all by itself, and then I'm going to shove it into equation 2. And I hope you're getting comfortable with this little notation I use, because it's just really helpful for me. It's a shorthand that really shows me what I'm doing. If you're struggling to get through EE310 or whatever the course is at your university, um, it's making it easy for your grader to see what you're doing. That always helps you. So after I solve equation 1 for I1 and I substitute it into I2, equation 2 becomes what we see right here. So equation 2 is kind of looking ugly. So let's apply uh, what we know about the ideal transformer. We know that the coefficient of coupling for the ideal transformer is equal to 1. So that means that m is equal to root L1, L2. And so what I can do is I can do a little work on this part of the expression right here, because if m is equal to root L1, L2, then m squared is going to be L1, L2. So let's put that in there and see what happens. And we see that L1 cancels out, and I have J omega L2 I2 minus J omega L2 I2, and these rascals cancel out. And I am left with just my middle term. So I have V2 is equal to root L1 L2 divided by L1. And I'm sorry, times V1. And then now I, I simplify my square root and I get V2 equals root L2 over L1 times V1. <clears throat> and what we find, though I'm not going to dig deep into it here, is that <coughs> root L2 over L1 is equal to the turns ratio of the transformer. And so I can say that n, I wrote it as a little n, but it's often written as a big n. <clears throat> I kind of go both ways when I do that. Um, not for any good reason, just because I'm kind of lame sometimes. Um, so n is equal to the turns ratio of the transformer. Or in other words, the turns ratio is equal to just the number of turns on the secondary divided by the number of turns on the primary. So what we've derived <coughs> is that V2 is equal to n times V1. Well, we saw that before at the beginning of um, the previous lecture. So let's return to our little simple derivation that we did there. So we have n1 turns, n2 turns. v1 is equal to n1 d phi1 dt. That's just Faraday's law. And v2 is equal to n2 times d phi2 dt. It's Faraday's law. Now, since k equals 1, 
all the flux stays in the happy place here, happy meaning high permeability. And so I know that d phi 1 and d phi 2 are going to be the same because phi 1 is equal to phi 2. So we're just going to call that d phi dt. So let's put v2 on top of v1 and we're going to get n2 d phi dt divided by n1 d phi dt equals n2 over n1, which is equal to our terms ratio. So that's another way to show it. Here's the symbol for the ideal transformer, uh, very commonly seen in industry. Um, the way we show an ideal transformer is we show the little iron bar between the primary and the secondary. Makes good sense because you usually have that high perme permeability core and iron has a very high permeability. Though there are really cool ways to make transformer cores these days. Um, we, they use laminates because if you have laminates then you don't get as much core loss and they also use um, uh, little little pieces of iron that have insulation around them because that reduces core loss. Um, as I started off in uh, lecture 13, transformers are just really cool. So here's our symbol for an ideal transformer. And you can see I put my dots there because if I had V1 plus to minus and V2 plus to minus and the dots like this, I'm going to have V2 over V1 equals N2 over N1. But now let's move this dot over here, but we're still going to define V2 as plus to minus here. Now it's going to be V2 over V1 is equal to minus N2 over N1. So yeah, those dots are important. So now that we've defined our ideal transformer, we know that it absorbs no power. Now, that's in EE310. Real transformers absorb a small amount of power. Um, every once in a while, you hear about a power outage because a transformer blew up or exploded at a power station. Because sometimes they just get too hot and they poof or in the old days on power lines where I grew up, every once in a while a transformer would blow up. And if you were lucky, it happened at night and you were out walking the dog and you actually got to see it. But in EE310, our transformers do not dissipate power. <clears throat> so because the transformer dissipates no power, I can say that the voltage times the current on the primary side is equal to the voltage times the current on the secondary side. This is an equation, and it's an equation that's right in the book. But let's look at it. V times I on the primary equals V times I on the secondary. And let's not worry about all the signs now. What let's do is let's say V times I on the primary, or how much power I put into the primary, is going to be V times I on the secondary. In other words, all the power that I was able to dump in the primary went to the load, and none of it got dissipated in here. So that's all this equation is telling us. Let's put it in phasor form. V1 times I1 equals V2 times I2. Duh, right? So what let's do is let's work with this. V2 over V1, we just put V1 under V2, is equal to I1 divided by I2. And that, we know that V2 over V1 is equal to the terms ratio. So hey, look, two cool things here. One is the um, the currents follow the reciprocal of the turns ratio. That's one thing we see, right? Because V2 over V1 is n, <clears throat> but I1 divided by I2 is equal to n. So <coughs> 
that's a that's a cool thing um, that we see here. Um, so I said two things, but I only mentioned one. I don't want to do the second one right now. So this equation is right in our book. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to develop a formula for reflected impedance. And it's going to be, um, it's not going to be complicated. It's just going to use the fact that we are not going to dissipate any power in our transformer. But before we make a formula for it, let's say, let's figure out what reflected impedance is. Here's the deal. I got a Z2 over here on the secondary side. And I know that it's getting its power out of this nice ideal transformer. But I know that there's a turns ratio going on. So if I've got Z2 over here, what's the impedance that I'm going to see looking in right here? I see Zn going in. But what is Zn given that I have some turns ratio and I have some load impedance out here? Well, the reflected impedance is Zn. Or in other words, how does Z2 reflect to Zn? Now, intuitively, you go, well, I bet it's going to depend on Z2, duh, and it's going to depend on the turns ratio of the transformer. And your intuition is absolutely right. Let's do it. I love these derivations because they're so cool. They're so simple. And this is why I do not go out of my way to remember them. Because whenever I need them, I can always derive them by V, v1 times I1 equals V2 times I2. And I scribble it down a few times. And then I write my relationship. And I say, oh, that's really cool. And then I go get a cup of coffee. And then I come back and, and work with it. I don't waste my time trying to remember these formulas, especially because if I just use it from memory, um, I'm not go I may make a mistake applying it, or I may not remember it correctly. That's probably more likely what will happen. Okay, so reflected impedance refers to what impedance I see looking into the, into the transformer based on the turns ratio and the voltage. I know that V2 is equal to n times v1. And I know that i2 is equal to i1 divided by n. So I got v1 and I got i1. And I'm kind of being like the seagull here. I know both these things are true. But I can get the input impedance by just saying it's v1 divided by i1, right? So let's do it. V1 divided by I1 is equal to Zn. V1 is equal to V2 over N. I1 is equal to N times I2. So we put that in, we wiggle things around a little bit, and we go, ooh, cool, an N squared, ones, they're not very interesting. Oh, but look, V2 divided by I2. V2 divided by I2. Is that not Z2? Yeah, that's Z2. So I'm going to replace my V2 over I2 by Z2, and that gives me what I'm looking for. Zn equals, grind, 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 1 over the turns ratio times Z2. Our intuition said, the input impedance looking in here is going to depend on the turns ratio, and it's going to depend on Z2. And here is our formula that we come up with for that. Pretty cool. So let's just look at this in a little more detail. I got Z2. Z2 will likely be complex, but it's going to be multiplied just by this scalar, isn't it? So if I have you know, 1 plus J3 is Z2, um, I'm just going to divide both my real and my complex parts by M squared. And that's what I'm going to see looking in here. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, how cool is that? I can change one impedance 
into another impedance and not lose any power in the process. Well, a lot of really good engineers have thought that, and that's why we use them for impedance matching, and that's why I'm going to do an example of that in this lecture. But before we move on, we did some math, so I always like to do a sanity check just to make sure that, that things are looking good and I really understand them. Here's our sanity check. I've got a voltage source, I've got a ideal transformer with a 2 to 1 terms ratio. Sometimes we'll write n equals 2 for this, for 2 to 1. Uh, more than likely, what I'll do is I'll actually show the, the values here. Because that way I can say, look, either n can be the primary or the secondary, but the bottom line is you got a ratio of two turns on this piece to one turn for this piece. So that's why I usually show them this way. I got my dots, so I know that a positive going voltage here is going to give me a positive going voltage here. So let's work with this. Here's my turns ratio, it's 2. My equations tell me that V2 over V1 is equal to 2. So I got 10 volts here, that means I got 20 volts here. Or in other words, V2 is equal to the turns ratio times V1. Turns ratio times V1 gives me 20 at an angle of 0. All right. I got 20 volts here according to my equations, so that means I2 is going to be 20 divided by 15, or 20 volts divided by 15 ohms, is going to be 1.33 amps. So I got 1.33 amps right here. And so the power in the 15 ohm resistor is going to be 1 half I squared R is going to be 13.33 watts. Now what let's do, and what I'm doing, I'm just using the equations that I developed for the transformer and I'm using our power relationships. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the formula to reflect this impedance to here. So I'm going to look at what the impedance is looking in here. And Let's figure out, let's just say, what, what do I think I'm going to find? Here's what I'm going to find. I'm going to find this 13.33 watts here better be the power coming out of this supply. Uh, power delivered by this supply better equal the power dissipated by this resistor. So using our formula, the impedance looking in right here is going to be Z load over n squared, or z secondary over z squared, or z2 divided by z squared, whatever you want to call it, but it's 15 ohms. So 15 divided by the turns ratio squared, I got 3.75 ohms when I look in here. So I1 is going to be 10 volts divided by 3.75 ohms is 2.67 amps. Didn't we say above that I2 over I1 better follow the reciprocal of the turns ratio? Let's check. I2 was 1.33 amps, right here. I1, we just said, was 2.67 amps. So the ratio of those is, ratio is 1 over 2, which is 1 over the turns ratio, so we're feeling good. Now let's look at the power delivered by this source. It's going to be equal to 1 half Vs squared divided by Z primary. Now we could say, hey, wait, where are all your angles? All the angles are 0 because it's a resistive circuit. Um, you may say, hey, but wait, you have a transformer here. Everything looks resistive. Go back to the assumptions. So. The power from the supply is just going to be 1 half times 10 squared divided by the impedance it sees, which is 3.75 ohms, and I get 13.33 watts. 
So what we've done in our sanity check is we've just kind of taken a little tour around <clears throat> the landscape of this problem, and we found that everything makes sense, so it gives us just a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling. Now let's do a problem out of the book. This is problem number 13.8 out of Alexander and Saidiku. I believe we're the fifth edition, so it may be a different problem in other editions. But here's our problem. We've got a voltage source. We've got an ideal transformer. See that little iron bar in there? And we see that the dots are on different sides, so we're going to have to be careful uh, with that. And we're asked to find the output voltage, VO, right here. We're going to do this three different ways. Uh, first way is we're going to reflect the load to the transformer input. We're going to get the current. We're going to reflect the current over here and then multiply it by this impedance. The second way we're going to do it is we're going to say, let's just use mesh analysis. We can absolutely do that with transformers. Uh, you'll see we'll have two equations and four unknowns, but then we'll quickly boil it down to two equations and two unknowns. And then the last way we'll look at it is we'll draw a dotted line right here and say, what's this whole mess look like as a Thevenin source? So by the time we've done all three approaches, you should have a pretty good feel for this. So strategy number one, we're going to reflect the load to the transformer input. So we're basically going to take all this stuff to the right of the line that I'm drawing right now. Everything to the right of the line, we're going to reflect that into a single impedance. Then we can easily get the current I1, and then we'll use our current relationship I2 over I1 equals minus 1 over N. Notice that minus sign. Look at those dots. And that'll give us I2. And then the output voltage is I2 times the capacitor impedance. That'll give us VO. So here we go. Our load is equal, <clears throat> or our secondary impedance, I suppose we could say, is equal to 16 minus J24. So what I want to do is I want to reflect that over here. And it is going to reflect to 16 minus J24 divided by N squared. Don't worry about the dots for this impedance reflection. They don't enter. They don't enter the picture. So we take our 16 minus J24. We scale it by 1 over N squared. And I get 1 minus J1.5. And Remember that N in this context is equal to the turns ratio, which is the secondary divided by the primary. Um, sometimes we're not sure what the secondary and the primary is. So for N, for impedance matching, it's the number on the other side of the transformer divided by the number on the side that we're on. And you're going to see that as we get further into this problem. So what I can do now is say, what is this effective impedance? This whole clump of stuff over here, it's 1 minus J1.5. So let's replace all this stuff with 1 minus J1.5. That's the reflected secondary. And let's get I1. I1 is just going to be my voltage source divided by the impedance that it sees. Or in other words, it's going to be 240 divided by uh, 1 minus J1.5 plus 2. And I get 64 plus J32 amps. That's a lot of amps. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to reflect I1 to I2. And we have our equation for that, because the current scales as the reciprocal 
of the turns ratio. And we got to put that negative sign in because of those dots. You can tell by where that negative sign is that I didn't do that the first time around. So easy mistake to make. So I2 is going to be equal to I1, negative I1, oops, divided by N. And that gives me my 64 minus J32, that's my I1, divided by N, which is um, 4, and I get I2. So now I have I2 right here, so I just have to multiply that by my capacitive impedance, and I get VO. So VO is equal to I2 times the impedance of the capacitor. Here's my I2. Here's my impedance of the capacitor, and out pops the answer. So that was a good way to do the problem. Let's do it another way. Now what I'm going to do is say, I have two currents here, and they're really mesh currents. And of course, there's no conductive coupling between these circuits, but the coupling is defined by the transformer. So there's no conductive coupling. There's just magnetic coupling, sorry. And the magnetic coupling is defined by the transformer. So let's write some mesh equations. Here's Vn, so minus Vn, I'm following this equation here, plus 2i1 plus, ugh, looks like V primary to me. Okay, plus V primary equals zero. I don't love it, but I know it's right. Now I have my V secondary here. It's a voltage rise, so I'm going to say minus V secondary plus 16I2 minus J24, because the negative sign here, times I2 is equal to zero. And you notice I didn't deal with the dots in this equation, in these equations, because I'm being like the seagull. All I know is this is defined as Vs. So I don't need to deal with it. I just said, okay, it's a minus to plus of Vs. There you go. But the trouble for the seagull is that we have two equations and we have four unknowns. So that means we got to say two more profound things about this circuit. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to use our relationships for the transformer, which intuitively makes sense, right? So VP is equal to minus Vs over N. So we now have our, our relationship between the primary and secondary voltages, or in other words, we have a relationship between these two things. And we also know that, and you see this negative sign here, and you know where that comes from, and I1 is going to be minus N times I2. Watch that dot. But here's our current relationship. So here are our other two profound things. Now, if I wanted, I could make two more equations, but I chose not to do that. What I did is I just um, substituted. So I've got a formula for V primary, which is just Vs over minus Vs over M. So you can see in equation one, and of course I've indexed my equations the way I like to do it, VP turns into minus Vs over N. And down here, I have my relationship for I1 uh, and I2. And so Vs 16I2 and Oh, I didn't have to use that here. So here is my, my second equation. So at this point, I have two unknowns. I have I2 and Vs. Two equations, two unknowns. I throw them into a matrix. 
and I get my, my current, and I2 becomes six, negative 16 minus J8, just like we got in the last iteration of this problem. Same thing. And I multiply that by minus J24, and I get the same output voltage. So this was our mesh analysis approach to the problem. Now let's do the third approach. In this approach, what I'm going to do, you can see that I pulled my cap off and I drew my dotted line here, except I didn't actually draw it. And I said, I'm going to represent everything over here with a feminine source. Now, before we get to the details of this, why might we do this? Um, well, the main reason I would represent it as a feminine source is because it gives me the greatest visibility and intuition into all this stuff. Because this thing's just a big clump here of stuff. But I don't have a lot of intuition about it. But if I represent it as a feminine source, like I have right here, I go, oh, 960 volt source with about 50 ohms uh, series resistance. Well, that tells me a lot. <coughs> so now I have, I, I have a much better intuitive idea of what's going on here. Um, another place where the feminine source might come in handy is if I need to solve the problem a whole bunch of times, instead of doing what we did in the last two approaches over and over and over again, wouldn't it be much easier if we just had one voltage source and one resistor? So I find myself in my regular work in industry um, converting things to Thevenin all the time. So that's why we might do that here. So let's do it. So what we're going to do is we're first going to represent everything to the left of the capacitor as a feminine source. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to load the circuit with the capacitor, and then I just have a simple voltage divider to get the output voltage or the voltage at the capacitor. So getting my feminine source, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get the open circuit voltage. And that's going to be pretty easy because I got no current in the secondary, right? Because it's open. So that means I'm going to have no current through here, which I, means I have no voltage drop here. So whatever the voltage here is, is going to be my feminine voltage. I got no current here. So my reciprocal relationship of the I2 being 1 over n times I1 um, is going to tell me that I got no current here. So I got no current in the primary or the secondary. So let's work with this no current in the primary. I got 240 here. I got no current here, so I got no voltage drop. So that means I got 240 here. 240 times the turns ratio gives me 240 times 4, which is 960. But I look at those dots and I know that that's going to be minus 960, the way I have defined Vs. So minus 960 volts here, no current, minus 960 volts here. My Thevenin voltage is going to be minus 960 volts. Now I'm going to get Z Thevenin by shorting uh, the voltage source here, <clears throat> and I'm going to just look inside and see what the impedance is. So now I want to know what the impedance is looking in from the secondary. Now, for our previous problems, we looked at the impedance of the prime looking into the primary, and we said it's equal to 1 over n squared times Z, uh, Z secondary. But now I want to look in this way. So you have this issue of, well, this is really the secondary, and 
this is really the primary, but I have to be careful here because if I want to use the 1 over n squared relationship, I have to invert my terms ratio, don't I? Because this now looks like the secondary in our derivation. Here's how I keep it straight. Is if I want to determine the, um, the impedance from this side of the transformer, I'm going to say that my turns ratio is equal to what I got on the other side divided by the side that I'm looking at. Works over here. If I'm looking for the impedance looking in here, the turns ratio is going to be the number of turns on the other side divided by the number of turns on the side I'm looking. For here, the turns ratio I'm going to work with is the number of turns on the far side divided by the number of turns on the side I'm looking at. So the n that you'll get here is 1 over the n you'll get here. And you can do that different ways. That's just a little crutch that I like that uh, helps me when I do these. So z thevenin is equal to, let's look in. Well, we got 16, so let's put that in there. And in this case, I said it's 2 times n squared because I actually used the n from up here. But you can do it that way, or you can do it the way I just showed you. But you're always going to get the same result. So I add those up. 16 plus 2 times 4 squared. Or if we did it the way I showed you here, it would be 1 over 1 over 4 squared. You get the same number, and I get 48 ohms. So my Thevenin circuit is 960 minus 960 and 48 ohms. Let's get the Thevenin impedance another way. And I'm going to give you just a second to think about that while I take a hit off my coffee. The other way we could get the Thevenin impedance is if we know that our Thevenin um, equivalent circuit looks like what's on the left of my line here, all I have to do to get the Thevenin impedance is just short the output, get the current, get the short circuit current, and then divide the Thevenin voltage by the short circuit current, and I got the Thevenin impedance. Could we do that here? Sure. Just short this out, and then you now have 16 ohms in your secondary. You could reflect it to the primary like we did on our first example. Get I1, reflect that to I2, and there's your short circuit current. Lots of ways to do this problem. I recommend you try them all and then do it for 35 years in industry, and then you'll get pretty good at it. So you could um, get the Thevenin um, impedance that way. But we did it the way we did it. We got a good example or a good answer. Here it is. Now let's get the output voltage with a simple voltage divider. Sorry, nothing is simple in this class. V out is equal to Vs, which is minus 960 times negative J24 divided by negative 24 plus J48. Out pops the answer. Same answer we got for the other two. Um, uh, iterations of this problem. So I hope doing it those different ways really helped pound these points in. Um, I know you're all busy. you got a lot of stuff to do, but there are a lot of other ways to do that problem. So if you have time to um, do them, or just sit there and think about other ways to do the problem, and maybe just sketch strategies out and see if your strategies would work. Um, and I, I think that'll, that'll really help you. Let's take a look at an example of how transformers are used to provide power to our homes.
how power comes from the power generating station and ends up as the outlet in your house. I wrote electric power dissipation. Uh, sure wish I could get into my office to get to my notes because I'd like to fix that. Should be distribution. But let's look at all the pieces and look at why they're there, why they're the way they are. So in the system, we have a generating station. And I've got a picture of a generating station here. This is Diablo Canyon. <clears throat> it's a nuclear generating station in San Luis Obispo, which is uh, where I went to college many, many years ago. <clears throat> the station was actually being built when I went to college, so we spent a lot of time uh, out at the front of it protesting it, because that was kind of something we did back then. But when I wasn't doing that or wasn't studying, we were out diving for abalone in this beautiful cove out here. You couldn't use scuba to do it. You had to free dive, but it was just a beautiful place to go diving. But as security got tighter around the plant, they would chase us off, um, but we would still go. We would just let them chase us off, but that's all another story. But this is a power generating station. And of course, we have coal burning stations. We have natural gas burning stations. We have nuclear stations. But in our picture, that is our source right here. And in this example, it's going to be 765,000 volts. That's a lot of volts. And it is going to go through, in our example, let's say it goes through 100 miles of power line. And the power line is these great big towers that you see out in the middle of nowhere where my what my student saw when he was out in his Jeep with all his buddies. And these towers look let's find some oh isn't that a beautiful car? Not that. Here's a good picture of what those towers look like. And you can see that those things are pretty high and they're pretty expensive. And you can see these big insulators here because you got 765,000 volts rattling around. So they want good insulation between these wires and the actual metal tower, which is grounded. Such a beautiful picture of those towers. I just love that. And there are, we have towers like this in the area where I live, and I ride my bike around these things, and we live kind of close to the ocean, so we get salty air. And at 765,000 volts, you hear these things going bzzz, and you see them crackling, or if I stay out too late on my bike, I can actually see the, um, I can actually see little sparks climbing around these insulators. It's really pretty cool. But, 765,000 volts is a lot of voltage, and these are really expensive towers. And in about 10 minutes, you're going to understand exactly why they do that. So we've got 100 miles of that, that, that power getting distributed through lines. Now, when it comes into your city, um, it's going to hit a substation. And a substation is really, uh, for our purposes, a big ideal transformer that's going to knock this 765,000 volts down to 10 kilovolts. Let's see what a substation looks like. Here's a substation. Yeah. This is a substation that my wife and I passed by on the way up to the mountains. And you can see this is a big transformer. It's got cooling going on because, and here are the, here are the um, here's, here are pieces of the cooling system because transformers actually um, do dissipate power, so they got to cool them because there's a lot of power going through this thing. I mean, you can see the size of it. Look at this. This is where someone would stand up to access this panel. So this thing's like 12, 15 feet high. Um, I bet you've got 765,000 volts right here, because look at that 
insulator. Isn't that cool? Um, so at the substation is where you deal with 765,000 volts, and it's going to go maybe four or five miles to your home because it's okay to send 765,000 volts across the desert in these great big huge towers, but you don't want to be distributing 765,000 volts in your neighborhood. That's, that's just not a good thing. Um, so, I mean, among other things, those crackles and pops will destroy your radio reception in the AM band, and it's also a safety hazard. Also, it requires those huge insulators and huge towers, and you don't want to put those in your neighborhood, because nobody, except for me, of course, would like to look at them. So, we locally distribute in a city at around 10 kilovolts. Now, going back to this substation, if you live in San Diego, um, we have a few of them around, but one of my favorites is right in La Jolla, um, where it's right off the Highway 5, uh, just west of 5. You look at it, and be careful because you'll be driving. Get your girlfriend to drive, and take a look at it because it has all the cool stuff. It has all those great big transformers. And from that station, it gives us 10 kilovolts that's getting distributed into La Jolla and Mira Mesa and stuff like that. So this is maybe, let's say 10 miles, something like that. A lot less than this, right? So now we need to knock the voltage down to 120 volts that goes into our homes. And we do that using a residential transformer. Let's see if we can find my residential transformer here. Here's a residential transformer. This is not put here just so your dog can pee on it or you can sit on it. What this thing is doing is it is converting that 10,000 volt distribution voltage down to 120 volts or 240 volts sometime. So we can now put it into your house at a nice safe voltage where we can use uh, Romex cabling and we can use you know cheap little outlets that we buy at Home Depot for 79 cents. So that's what your residential transformer does. Now, there's one right near your house, so what you might want to do if you take a break is get a cup of coffee or a beer, depending on what time it is, and take a walk and go out and stick your ear on this thing. And you're going to hear 60 hertz, because everything's going on at 60 hertz. This transformer is not perfectly efficient, so those fields moving around in there actually make it look like a little motor, and it's going to go and you're going to hear it. And you're also going to see that that sucker is going to get warm. It'll be a little bit warm. So that's your residential transformer. Before you leave, let your dog pee on it, because the, the power company is quite used to that, and it's safe for the dog. So here's our system, and what you can see is we start off with massive voltage, and we go across in these great big huge towers that cost like a hundred thousand bucks a piece to put in, and when they clean the lines, they actually have to use a helicopter to do it. Um, and then after we get the power into the city, we go into a big old transformer that knocks that voltage down to 10 kilovolts, and then we go to a residential transformer, we get 120 volts, that goes into our house and it's nice and safe. Don't touch it, but it's certainly safer than this voltage or this voltage. Why do that? Why not just say, save ourselves these massive towers, these big, stop, these big, uh, substations and these residential transformers just generate the power at 120 volts. Well, you'll see in a minute why that's true. So 
let's put some numbers in the example. These are all conjured up examples. Uh, if you show this to somebody who works for San Diego Gas and Electric, they'll go, hey, you're a professor. Eh, he's not quite exactly on. And if you do find someone who does that, have them get in touch with me because I'd love to buff my example out. But it's going to get the point across. So our substation, V2, is 10 kilovolts. V1 is 765 kilovolts. Here's the turns ratio of this transformer. It's 1 over 76.5. Now let's look at this transformer. It's 10 kilovolts on the primary. It's 120 volts on the secondary. V2 over V1. Turns ratio is 1 over 83. So you know the turns ratio of these two transformers now. But now let's go back to why we have all this stuff, because it's really simple and it makes really good sense. Let's say our system feeds about half of San Diego, and we have 316,000 homes at about 3 kilowatts apiece. 3 kilowatts? Yeah, that's about 3 people running a, um, a, a hairdryer at the same time. That's about a good average load. When I think about power, I always like to put some practicality on it. But we have this many homes, this many watts, so our system is delivering a gigawatt. It's 10 to the ninth watts. And we're also going to say that the distance from the substation to the consumer, meaning this, is insignificant compared to this. We're going to say this is what we're going to focus on. So let's take a look. Our current in the 765 kilovolt line is going to be 1 gigawatt, the power divided by the voltage. 1 gigawatt divided by 765 kilovolts is 1300 amps. That's a lot of current. And the loss in that line is going to be I squared R. And so what we'll do is we'll say that the loss is 1307 amps squared times 5.8 ohms, the resistance in the line, which we, we showed up here. That means we are losing 10 megawatts in this line right here. 10 million watts is warming the desert or warming the little birdies feet when they sit on this wire. Um, just as a fun thing, what is this wire? Is it solid copper? Uh-uh. Because of what's called the skin effect, this wire, if we cut one of these cross-sectionally, you'd see an aluminum outer skin and then the inside is going to be like fiberglass shards because they give it the strength to hang over those big canyons and hang between those two towers. Uh, and the two towers can be really far apart. But we got 10 million watts getting lost in this run of 100 miles. Power companies paying for that. You're not. So the power loss divided by the power generated is going to be 10 megawatts. That's a lot, but we're generating a gigawatt. So we're only losing 1%. So 1% of what our generating station makes is what's warming the little birdie's feet out in the desert. 1% isn't bad. I'm not going to spend twice as much on those towers to make that a half a percent. So that's a pretty optimized thing. And apparently, they're not going to make smaller towers and deal with 2%. Some smart person at the power company years and years ago figured that out. So now what let's do is let's say I don't want to distribute power at 760 kilovolts. I want to distribute power at 100,000 volts. 
it's not that much different. And it'll allow me to have smaller towers and smaller insulation, and I'll save a whole bunch of money out there in the desert. Let's do that. So we're going to distribute at 100,000 volts. Now the current is going to be 1 gigawatt, because we still got to get 1 gigawatt into San Diego, divided by 100 kilovolts. So our power went from 1,307 amps up to 10,000 amps out there in the desert. The line loss is going to be I squared R, which is going to be 10,000 squared, that's our current, times our resistance gives 588 megawatts. Let's look at the efficiency, because before we were cooking 10 megawatts out there in the desert. Now we're cooking 588 megawatts. Power loss divided by power generated is going to be 588 megawatts divided by 1 gigawatt. Holy cat, we're going to lose 60% of our power out there in the middle of the desert where if we distribute at 765 kilovolts, we're only going to lose 1% of the power. And so that explains why it is worth, I just have to look at them again because they're so cool. Where are we here? Come on. I just got to look at those beautiful towers again. That's why it's worth having these things out in the desert. It's a balance of efficiency of generation versus the cost of putting these suckers up. Now, this is really good practical stuff to know on a job interview. But let's generalize it beyond the power company. It's always best, it's always the most efficient to distribute power at high voltages because that way you can use smaller resistance cabling. Now in the olden days um, in the olden days cars were six volts and so it, when you press the starter button, they had starter buttons back then, um, you had to put a lot of current into that starter. Well, that current went through your corroded battery terminals, it went through your rusty connections, and you lost a lot of your power in those connections. And when you went to start your car, instead of going rawr, 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 like it does now, it go rawr, rawr, rawr. And yeah, a car will start with a starter motor doing that, but <laughs> not always. So in the mid 50s, they said, hey, Let's make cars 12 volts. And now, all of a sudden, they could use um, smaller gauge wires in the battery cables that went down to the starters. And your car started a lot better because you just wasted less power in your cables. It's why aircraft uses 28 volts. Um, and you could say, well, gosh, more is better. Why not, make, why not distribute 100 volts within an aircraft? Well, every once in a while, you spill a little gasoline when you're gassing the aircraft up. So you don't want 100 volts. So it's all a trade-off. But in general, for efficiency, you're better off distributing power at high voltage. And our little example here shows you exactly why that's true. So what I want you to do is at least pop out the concepts of this example in a job interview. And if it gets you the job, you owe me a cup of coffee. You know where my office is. I want to do one more example. Um, when I sold you guys on transformers, hopefully I sold you on transformers. I have one more lecture after this to do it. I said that transformers could be used for impedance matching. Impedance matching, or power factor correction, 
is nothing more than just maximum power transfer. So here's our example. I've got a feminine source and it's got 200 volts and it's got a 7K feminine impedance. Now, the problems that we've done up to now, we'd say, okay, tell me the load that goes right here. And you would have said, well, this is obviously resistive, so 7K, right? So that's the way we framed the problem up till now. But I'm going to frame this problem a little differently and definitely more practically. I've got this feminine source and I got to get maximum power into an 8 ohm speaker. So now I'm stuck with a load and I'm stuck with a source and I need to put something between here. Well let's see. Obviously I want as much of this source power to get into my speaker, right? Duh, I don't want to warm the room with my radio. So I'd like to have something really efficient in this question mark block. And of course, is this a practical problem? Well, yes and no. For me, it is. Um, in general, yes, it is. That's why it's in the lecture. But what is this? This is the output stage of my old 1938 Philco radio. It's a vacuum tube radio, so it has very high voltages in it. I've got shocked by it a few times because I'm not always careful as I should be. Very high voltage, but also very high impedances. So it is this critter right here. And it's such a beautiful radio, you really have to see it um, right side up. Come into my office sometime, I'll show you the back of it. It's got some really cool stuff going on inside. This radio was made in 1938, and it was a very high quality farmer's kind of radio. It was really high quality, but it was cheap. It was made all out of plywood, um, but the Philco's were really, really nice radios. So this is the circuit we're talking about is back in the vacuum tubes in the speaker of this sucker. So my vacuum tube output stage is 200 ohms at 7K. My speaker is 8 ohms. What am I going to put here? Well, duh, it's going to be a transformer, right? So we're given a source impedance. We're given a load impedance. We need to design the matching network. Uh, RF people use that term. But really, it's just a maximum power transfer problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shove a transformer in here. Here's my picture. Here's my 200, ohm, 200 volt source. Here's my 7K source resistor. Here's my 8 ohms. Here is my transformer. Um, ideal transformer? You're darn right, because I, I don't want to waste any of that magnetic flux. I want all the flux from here going in here because I want all the power from here going to here. So let's just reflect the impedance. The turns ratio is going to be some number n. And so the reflected impedance is going to be 8 ohms divided by n squared. What do I want Zn to be? Maximum power transfer. I want it to be 7K. So to match, I want Zn in to be 7K. So let's just figure out the turns ratio we need. 7K, 7K is equal to 8 divided by n squared. I need a turns ratio of 1 over 29.5. In other words, 29.5 turns here for every turn here. Let's take another look. Want to see it? That is such a beautiful car. I had so much fun at that show. That's, that's one of my little babies. Here, is that transformer. It's mounted right on the back of the speaker of this radio. And so 
it's 7k output impedance coming from this tube and this transformer lets it drive that 8 ohm speaker. Now, when I was restoring this radio, I had the speaker recone, so they put in, you know, nice new paper and everything like that. But this transformer was dead meat. It was actually open, so I had to throw it away. So what I did is I went to a nice manufacturer, Hammond, and they actually make a cool little replacement for these kind of transformers. And I just want to show this to you to give you an idea of what a transformer data sheet looks like. A couple of things. First of all, the actual transformer, the core has two little windows in it. You can see one of the windows that all the windings are wound on, and then it goes out this way and it goes out this way. This, out, this piece here is made of metal and it shields the transformer. It also allows you to mount it. You see that on my primary, I have two wires going in and then I got a bunch of wires going out. Hey, wait a minute, that's not what transformers look like. But it is, because they want to make that one transformer usable for lots of different applications. And so that's why you have two terminals on your primary, and then you have a bunch of them on your secondary. So what I did with this transformer is I found the secondary wires that I wanted and then I just clipped the rest of them off. Now, you will also see that this transformer, they don't define it by turns ratio. They define it by its ability to match loads. So they have input impedance, they have output impedance, and it is specified by the its matching ability, but you can calculate the turns ratio for this thing. What else do we have? It's not perfect. Uh, at low frequencies, the inductance just isn't high enough, and so the transformer starts to not be a transformer anymore. Uh, but at audio frequencies, it's pretty good. I mean, at 100 hertz, we're only down 2 dB, and you can see that it's, these curves are all indexed by how you choose to use it. Data sheets typically do that. Um, what else do we have? Wow, on this data sheet, they didn't even tell us where the dots were because it's an audio transformer, so they don't really care, but they really should have shown us where the dots were. So. This is just a, um, an example of a data sheet for a transformer, and I just wanted to show that to you. Okay, and that is our lecture. Um, as I guess you can tell, this is a lecture I really enjoy giving because I think transformers are just really cool. Um, our next lecture uh, is just going to be examples of cool things you can do with transformers. And of course, the reason I'm doing that is to pound these concepts in. I would like you to consider viewing lecture 14a, uh, which is called <clears throat> the ideal transformer impedance matching. And I just want to give you a quick, um, a quick overview. In this problem, you're given this source and you're given this load and you need to use an ideal transformer and one additional component so that the load receives maximum power from the source. So it's different than the problem that we just worked. It's a little harder, but I'm going to go through it on the next lecture. So that concludes this lecture. I look forward to seeing you all in office hour and look forward to having you on my next lecture.